joke I like here at MIT is the saying that 80% of us have imposter syndrome and the other 20%, they just don't know it yet. I like it because I find myself firmly in the first camp. I feel like really all I've ever done here is steal good ideas from smart people and cobble them together to form some kind of MacGyver solution for whatever problem I'm working on. It turns out though, according to our guest today, this is exactly the sort of thing that almost everyone should be doing. Professor Alex Pentland studies social physics. He utilizes the immense amount of data available to us nowadays to examine social interactions between groups of people. He's found the, at least to me, very surprising result that the single dominating factor in predicting how well a group is going to be able to perform a specific task is simply how well ideas flow between that group of people. I would have figured it would be decided on one lone genius on your group, but what really seems to matter is whether or not you have a diverse set of ideas that can freely flow in your team. Sandy also recently published a book which discusses, among other things, how society is able to store data in a way that local communities can benefit and individuals are able to have their privacy rights maintained. He's someone I easily could have spent 10 times as long talking to, and I hope in the near future I'll be able to ask him questions a second time. Professor Pentland, it's really great talking with you. Um, you're a professor here at MIT Media Lab, and I came to understand also a co-founder of Media Lab. Is that right? Um, well, I'm not just at Media Lab. I'm also in the business school and engineering school. Uh, was one of the core faculty for setting up the mm -hmm. new College of Computing. Mm -hmm. And I'm not a co-founder, but I am a co-creator, okay. which is to say I was like employee number th two or something <laughs> like that okay. and was department head for a while and all mm -hmm. that sort of stuff. Mm -hmm. So in looking up all the things that you do, it was actually difficult for me to summarize um, kind of what you're doing today because you're just doing so many things. Do you have a way that you kind of tend to describe what you're doing here? Well, I think of what I do in the following way. So um, the world has this new resource called data because everything's becoming digital. There's data about everything. Mm -hmm. And um, it will transform almost everything. Now, it could be bad or it could be good. You can get additional transparency, you can get better governments, you can get better medicine, or you could get 1984 on steroids. And so my mission is to make the good stuff come out and not so much the bad stuff. Yeah, so um, I really wanted to dive in with you um, in a little bit about all of your work on social physics, and you just came out with a new book called uh, Building the New Economy. Right. But before we get there, if I could just get a little bit of the background on you, um, one of the first things that stepped out that stuck out to me was that you did some work on counting beavers from space. Yes, my um, first job. Could you just tell us a little bit about how that works? So um, when I was uh, an undergraduate, I started a job as a programmer for a thing that's like Lincoln Labs, but in Michigan, Environmental Research Institute of Michigan. Mm -hmm. And they had just put up a satellite, one of the very first satellites for looking at land use and, and ecology and environmental things. And my first day, you know, I was there on this project to count beavers. Now, the thing that's a little tricky there is the resolution of the satellite is like 90 meters by 90 meters, and beavers tend to be a little smaller than that. Mm -hmm. uh, so the trick is, is that beavers make lakes, uh, and those little ponds are of a size that you can see from outer space. So if you count the ponds, you can figure out how many beavers there ought to be. Mm -hmm. And and that is interesting because it's something that most people don't sort of get. It's this notion of a correlated covariate that's mm -hmm. that's not just accidentally that way. It's part of a process you're observing. But of course, that's what I do today. There's all this data about things, which is not measure, meant to measure things like your mental health, but does. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so this is what uh, I came to know you call reality mining compared to data mining. Yeah, so so the story is a, a little more complicated than that. So, you know, this notion of looking at things from outer space at its time was as controversial as data is today uh, mm -hmm. because 
I, you could see my backyard and what I'm doing and people who are growing marijuana plots got busted because you could see that stuff, right? <laughs> sure. But um, at the same time, that's why we know there's global warming. That's why we know that there's deforestation because you could actually see it for the first time. It wasn't just rumors and examples. So, so the good things and the bad things come together like that, and you have to uh, have regulation and best practice and standards to help them. So reality mining was a, a phrase that we experimented with a while. I don't like it. It sounds too scary. Mm, okay. Um, so uh, uh, you know, the idea there was uh, in the 1990s, it was very clear to us that people were going to get computers on their bodies. Computers were getting smaller, batteries were getting better. There was a hint that there might be wireless. There was no wireless, there was no Wi-Fi, there was no cell phone, right? But it was clear that was going to happen. And we wanted to ask, what is that world going to be like? And so um, together with a bunch of students, like 20 students, we built little you know, PCs with motorcycle batteries, and some of them had ham radio, and... Um, and we experimented with it. And the thing that we found was all the things you see today, like, you know, Google Maps types of mm -hmm. stuff and SMS messaging and things. But the data was really the sort of thing that we hadn't anticipated. Mm -hmm. For the first time, you could really see for this group of people their behavior as an organism, as a social organism, continuously. And, of course, that's really scary. We had lots of debates about privacy and what we were going to do with that sort of thing. But at the same time, it took the fields of psychology and sociology and politics and made it real in a way that it couldn't be before. Mm -hmm. Before that, you'd have little lab experiments with just a small number of people, and you'd get something with a p-value, and you say, well, there's an effect. Is it important? I don't know. Does it work in this area? I don't know. But now you could begin to see how things really worked. Mm -hmm. And that's the social physics. Sure. Um, and I should mention, actually, that this is not my dream. This is a dream that's 200 years old. Uh, it started in France uh, along with the Enlightenment. Sure. Uh, and uh, the idea was to use statistics to understand cultural change. Mm -hmm. And that had some large effect. That's why we have a census today. So they started the whole idea of you have to measure people to be able to have a just society, mm -hmm. right? Because yep. otherwise you don't know where the people are or what they need. Um, but they didn't have very good statistics back then, and they didn't have data back then. It was very expensive. Mm -hmm. and so now we have data, and we have very good statistics, and it's time to revisit this question of what can we do to make government and society better and how do we deal with the proliferation of data in a way that threatens things like privacy and control and stuff like that mm -hmm. those are the urgent things and so that's what i focus on so could we talk a little bit um so in 2014 your book social physics came out and uh, i read it actually listened to it and as a physicist it was really interesting to hear um, you kind of describe social dynamics in terms that at least a physicist understands um, could you just walk us through some of the insights so one that really stuck out to me was the notion that the flow of ideas and uh, the easiness of ideas to flow in a group of individuals was the most important factor in determining group success measured by various metrics this was really surprising to me. I thought it would be just, well, your group is going to do great if you have one all-star, one rock star that's going to knock it out of the park. Mm -hmm. But what I learned from your book seemed to be really shocking that the important thing is to be able to have individuals uh, share ideas and have kind of a synergistic effect. Yeah, it's um, this is what I mean by being able to see how all that psychology and sociology and uh, the, the ad hoc things that we believe we know mm -hmm. uh, put to the test in real situations, in a variety of situations. And, um, you know, from the physics point of view, it's a little like a spin glass, but where it's heterogeneous. Mm -hmm. And um, the heterogeneity induces a reaction diffusion field on it. So what you get is you get clumping. And that's what we see as social groups and segregation. Uh, and the, the idea there is that if, if you think about it in a sort of a fitness evolutionary sort of context, uh, you need local connections to be able to validate things. Uh, 
is this really right? You know, right. To, to trade knowledge, share knowledge. Uh, also, there's a lot of exchange going on. Mm-hmm. I help you, you help me, this is the way it goes. But a huge amount of the value comes from these longer ties that people who aren't part of your group but have new ideas or new capabilities. And bringing them into your group is where things change. Mm. And so all around the world, every place we've looked, every continent, hundreds of cities, what you see is you see this pattern, which is that people who have more diverse social networks Mm -hmm. are more successful. They make more money. They live longer, blah, 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 blah. It's just like a rule of, of law or something. But this is people. Yep. And um, cities that have infrastructure that allow you to meet more people are wealthier, mm-hmm. always. Mm-hmm. And, and in fact, you can see them over time. Like uh, in Eastern Europe, as they change their infrastructure, one of the main things that happened is they got to talk to more people and they became more innovative. And you can show this is a causal process in lots of ways. You can look at things where they put in transportation networks or, or things like that. And in the data that we have, which I say is all these different continents, cities, etc., this is the dominant effect, period. It is often 50% of the variance, uh, whereas things that you would think of, like education, centrality, uh, training, things like that, make up the other 50%. Sure. Um, and so, you know, the intuition we have from personal experience is, is that, you know, you want to have a superstar. Yep. Right? Right. Yeah. Yep. And, and actually that's true if you have a problem or a group that has to make a decision under extreme time pressure. Mm. And uh, uh, you just have to do it now because you can't afford the overhead of communication and sort of getting everybody on the same page. Mm -hmm. Um, But when you get anything that is a little bit longer term so that you can afford that overhead, groups always beat individuals. And we have science papers about this and this. I mean, mean, it's like, this is just the way it is. I'm sorry. You may not believe it, but you're wrong, right? This is it. (laughs) I was wondering if you had any advice because there's, you know, a vast number of individuals who really value their individualism and, you know, kind of want to be the lone wolf who goes out and rocks it by themselves. Do you have any advice for those people um, on how they can kind of accept what seems to be a, you know, experimental fact that you're better off in a, a good social group? Well, being a lone wolf is not quite the same as not taking advantage of new ideas. Lone wolves do that too. But what they're not doing is they're not um, committing themselves to a local support group, Hmm. okay? So they're saying, well, what I'll do is I'll make all of my social ties, these long ones where I harvest ideas, Hmm. and only on a case-by-case basis will I develop a support group around a particular project. And um, that can be okay, Hmm. right? Um, But you have to recognize that the thing that makes you successful is not that you're alone, it's that you're harvesting very widely. And and if you're of a more mathematical bent, you ought to look at something called Thompson sampling. My students make fun of me for bringing this up all the time. (laughs) Um, It is the provably optimal way to make decisions in uncertain environments. So it's Mm -hmm. called... uh, uh, bandit problems, like one-armed bandits. Oh, okay, sure. Right? Yeah. So you've got a whole bunch of arms on these right. bandits, and you've got to figure out which ones you should be pulling. Yep. And what you've got to do is you've got to try some of them to see how they're going. Mm-hmm. You've got to observe other people's trials. Mm-hmm. And then there's a fairly simple, you know, Bayesian way to put that together to figure out what strategy you ought to be doing in terms of pulling arms and exploring. Mm-hmm. So the long ties are the exploring part where you're Mm. trying to find out which arms are good, which strategies are good. And then the exploitation part is that group of people that are helping you actually do things and the strategies you do every day. And you see this pattern everywhere. Everybody's life has this sort of habits, you know, which are the exploitation part. Mm -hmm. And then we do things that are new. And that's the harvesting new ideas part. Right. And... uh, Again and again and again, if you're not harvesting new ideas, you're not doing well in the long term. Hmm. So 
Um, do you have any practical advice for how um, people might go about exposing themselves to new ideas and exposing themselves to a more diverse set of ideas um, in just kind of their day-to-day life? Well, uh, yeah, uh, <laughs> there's lots of suggestions about this. Sure. Um, sort of in the MIT context, um, which is to say sort of engineering science and stuff like that, you're yeah. trying to actually understand and build things, right? right. Not just make money. It <laughs> works with money, too. Um, it helps to be really skeptical of all the things that everybody knows, Okay. right? Like when I look at things... Um, I just fundamentally don't believe them. I don't think they're wrong, but I don't think they have it all right. So I see lots of people, uh, you know, they read the classic paper and they say, this is the truth with a capital T. Sure. No, uh uh-uh. That was good for the data they had and the sort of tools that they had at that time, but it's probably different than that. And, And the fact that this is the received wisdom tells you that, um, it's a problem where nobody is looking for what's wrong with it, right? And it'll sure. be a battle to get that across. Sure. But, but it's, you know, in other phrases like emperor's new clothes, right? right? I yeah. mean, there are these things that everybody knows that are not right. Right. Okay. Yeah. Boy, that's an important thing to do. Mm-hmm. So my personal strategy is to look for things like that where you say, oh, everybody believes it, but that doesn't seem quite right. Mm-hmm. And and that's facilitated by having uh, data about the phenomena, because often the data doesn't show what everybody thinks it does show. Right. You say, well, there's something wrong here. Let's let's figure that one out. Sure. Um, and you have to be um, a little brave to do that. On my door, there's a little thing from Skeen that says, no guts, no glory, <laughs> right? Because <laughs> sure. if, if you're poking holes in, in famous theories, mm-hmm. you know, you're going to get arrows yeah. shot at you. So you ought to know what you're doing. And yeah. um, it's easier when you have a record of being successful at that than it is the first time out of the gate. Sure. But you can always pick things like that. On the other side of things, um, how do you, uh, or could you give some advice for how not to go too much in the other direction? So specifically, I mean, 500 years ago or so, everyone knew that the earth was flat, um, or most people, you know, were really yeah. convinced the earth is flat. And then some brave people um, suggested that it's, it's not flat and it's round. And now we're very confident that it's, you know, a three-dimensional structure. Yeah. Of course, you have these people who are, you know, convinced again that the earth is flat. And, um, you know, that's going in the opposite direction of kind of the truth, but is something that, you know, you and I would both say is, you know, clearly not something worth spending your time on. So the way to think about this is um, to look at the frame in which all this happens. So, you know, yeah, you write papers and blah, 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 but that's actually not what you care about. Sure. What you care about is changing the world and having impact. Mm-hmm. And if you sound like a raving lunatic, no one's going to listen to you. <laughs> So yeah. guess what? You could have you could be a hundred percent right, mm. and it's not going to do anything. Right. Uh, you could have this wonderful thing, and if you don't get it out there, uh, you might as well have not done it. Right. So you have to craft things that other people will understand and move them in the right direction. Hmm. So this is a this is like lobbying <laughs> or something. Sure. Know. You know, you say right. you don't like go for what you think is probably the 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 ultimate conclusion. But you go for that first step that's going to get them going down that road, Got right? It. Yeah. And and you can really nail it. And and they'll appreciate that. They'll probably say, well, here's this classical theory, and there's a little uh, epsilon term on the end or something like that. Mm-hmm. And then they'll realize that, no, actually, it's worse than that. <laughs> okay. <Right. laughs> but um, so, so you you... 50% of your job as a scientist or an engineer is communication. Sure. If you don't communicate with people and you haven't done anything. And in fact, as a larger thing, it's, you know, influencing the world. Right. And so you have to be able to talk to all these different types of people in their language and tell them things that um, they will be willing to accept, which are the first stage in their journey. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So along the ideas of what you just mentioned, it's really important to talk with people. It's really important important to be able to get your ideas out. You were noted, I forget by who, as 
something like one of the seven most powerful data scientists in the world. Yes, work out all <laughs> yeah. the time. Right, <laughs> yeah, stronger yeah, than yeah, me yeah. by a lot. Yeah. Um, so I've seen you mention that's kind of, you know, maybe not the right adjective to use. Um, but I do get a sense that you're really able to do a lot. And I don't know, could you just give us maybe some thoughts on how is it that you've been able to do what you've done and um, where do you get your ideas from that seem to be, you know, really impactful and important? Well, um, I've already said, so, you know, we have this huge transformation happening with data. Mm-hmm. And uh, uh, as I've been saying, and recently the Chairman Xi of China has been saying, yeah. data is a new means of production, like capital or labor or land. So mm-hmm. think about that. That means that this transformation is just as important as money or labor. It's fundamental to the fabric of our future society, mm-hmm. and it's not a minor effect at all. You really want to get that right. Mm-hmm. Okay, so. There's a big problem, okay? Mm-hmm. Uh, it's not um, genetic engineering, which is another one. Sure. <laughs> <You know? laughs> Working uh, on it. Yeah. yeah, okay. That one <laughs> that one matters too. But but you know, I'm I gotta choose your battles. So I'm gonna choose that battle. And then what I'm gonna try and do with that is I'm going to try and uh, pick things that are edgy. So edgy means that people feel a little uncomfortable about it all. Like, um, you know, privacy was uh, a really edgy thing. It's a lot more resolved now. It was one of these things when we realized that all these devices were putting off data all the time. Mm-hmm. It's like you go, wow, that's like sort of weird, isn't it? Right. You know, and from a scientist's point of view, this is like you've died and gone to heaven. Right. Absolutely. Finally see things. Right? Oh, yeah. <laughs> you know? But you think about that in the rest of the world and you go, oh, my God, this is really. Mm-hmm. And so, so. um we would say, well, there's something about that. It's like a sore point. It's a point where, you know, and they tell you not to pick at sores and things. Well, no, pick at sores. Right? Mm-hmm. <laughs> so it's a sore point, and we sort of thought about it, and we realized that data um, was important, and the core thing is it didn't have any ownership principles. Yeah, It was supposed to be free, right? It just flows everywhere like air or something like that. Yeah. No, actually, yeah. people own data. Mm-hmm. It's your data, or I did something to measure it, now it's my data, or mm-hmm. we did it together. And clarifying that is almost the fundamental thing for a means of production. It's like, here's money. Whose money is it? <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> good, good first question. Sure. Or labor. Is it my labor or your labor, right? right. You know? And so, so those things come up. And then once you've... So I was I led a discussion on, on data ownership mm-hmm. uh, at Davos, you know, which is all these high end people. Yep. <laughs> um, and they invite people like me as the entertainment or the provocateurs. <laughs> sure. Seriously, right? that's, that's the idea. But we had the justice minister of the EU and the mm-hmm. head of the American Federal Trade Commission there, and the sure. CEO of Citibank and stuff. And we talked yep. about this and came up with what eventually, uh, without much change at all, was GDPR. So the privacy regulation in Europe really mm-hmm. came out of that. Um, but once you take that step, then you say, well, okay, so you can see that this, you know, raw place is, you know, progress is being made. What's the next step beyond that? And right. um, I think the next step beyond that for me has been things like, well, there's a lot of leaks in the system where <laughs> people aren't realizing what's getting out there. Okay, so that's a thing to look at. But then more recently, this is my newest book, mm-hmm. is the realization that um, a means of production like money or labor is also power. It's something that has a uh, important function in the governance of society. Sure. And so saying, oh yeah, it's your duty, your data, um, it's nice, but it doesn't really do anything. Because a, it's not worth that much, and B, what would you do with it, right? You know, right. Maybe you'd change your exercise regime, but it doesn't really help you yeah. much. Um, maybe you make a couple hundred bucks off of it. Well, great, yeah, but sure. you know, it's not, not changing, changing the world, yeah, right? Yeah, sure. Um, and you look back and you say, well, what happened when money became something that was common, right? Because there was a point, like, for instance, in the United States, right. until... Um, 
you know, sort of 1850 or so. Mm-hmm. It was money, but mostly it was barter and right. things like that. I mean, you know, mm-hmm. um, and there were no banks except these big sort of commerce banks. Mm-hmm. And in the 19, 1870s, what happened was things became more monetized and farmers and farming communities felt that they were being exploited by the Eastern banks. And so they said, well, screw that. We're going to set up our own banks. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and they did. They set up agricultural banks, which really transformed the whole system because suddenly you had communities taking control of this new means of production. Mm-hmm. And then you got credit unions and things like that. And, and that's evolved over time. Same thing in the early 1900s. You had big corporations, industrialization, and suddenly labor was this means of production. It was a commodity, and people were being abused by big companies. So what did they do? Well, they formed into unions, right. and and they pushed back, and they bargained collectively, and eventually got government to write rules and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. Um, and the same thing has to happen with data. Yeah. You know, you by yourself, that's wonderful, but if you got your whole community together, you could really go out there and you could say, well, look, we're not getting the health care you said we are. See, mm-hmm. we have everybody's data here. Mm-hmm. You know, we're not getting the options we want. We're not getting the opportunities, blah, blah, whatever it is, mm-hmm. right? You could understand your situation and advocate for yourself with the data. And so just like with banks where, uh, say, let's talk about credit unions. Credit unions are owned by the members. Yep. They're not like somebody else. Mm-hmm. And they don't own your money. They hold your money mm-hmm. for investment, right? So uh, a, a data union or data bank would uh, hopefully be owned by the people, mm-hmm. the members, and they don't own your data. They help you manage your data. Like, for instance, they can look across all the data in the community and say, you know, the medical people are not treating us right. Right. Right? Mm-hmm. And if you go to the medical people and you say, look, no, we have... 10,000 people, Mm -hmm. you say you're doing this, but you're not. Right. Something's got to move, right? Sure. And so that's where the value for a community is uh, for this sort of data. And you can imagine that in employment. You can imagine it in government. You can imagine it. Yes, there's some monetary value, but that's not the big part. So with these ideas of data unions, um, could you talk a little bit about how you're able to uh, kind of extract insights, how a data union would be able to extract insights while maintaining individual privacy? Um, if you know, yeah. you're storing your data somewhere, how is that maintained? Well, I can talk about concrete projects, right? Sure. Um, so, you know, beginning things are, uh, well, let me think about what's a good, let me give you a project that one of my guys is doing, sure. Dan Kalachi. So you have gig workers out there, right? Like mm-hmm. delivery workers. Yep. Um, and they have no idea whether they're being treated fairly and it's not a union, they have no benefits, blah, blah, blah. Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, but all that stuff happens on their phone. Yep. And you can scrape those bits and there's nothing anybody can do about it. Mm-hmm. And, and legally <laughs> they can say, no, you can't do that. But no, you can't. Mm-hmm. And so you can imagine, and this is what we're doing and have done, is that you get all of the delivery workers in a town, you know, signing up for this. And what there is, is there's a not-for-profit entity Mm -hmm. set up by the gig workers, you know, that can be very lightweight. Um, And what it does is it basically owns a piece of cloud. And your data now comes off your phone and goes there. Still your data. Mm-hmm. But you give permission to the NGO, this this collective thing, mm-hmm. to ask, how much does the average person make from, you know, Instacart during the middle of the day versus the end of the day? And does that same person make more money than uh, doing Instacart or doing Amazon, whatever it is, fresh right. food? I forget the Amazon Go, maybe? I, Go, sure. yeah, there's yeah. Go, and there's Fresh, Fresh and there's yeah. all those things. We don't use them. <laughs> um, anyway, so, so, so what you're doing is you're holding the data, this NGO is holding the data for the workers to get insights about what is a good strategy for them mm-hmm. or where are they being screwed, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. And, and so it's still their data. Right? But they've given permission to let people look at it and figure out stuff that they couldn't do on their own. And it's not just that they don't know how to do it. 
you need to have the aggregate data right. to get an answer, yeah, right? Absolutely. So you need, you know, a good sample of all the people to say, you know, don't do Instacart, do go, right? You know, or or you know, do Instacart in the evening, but go during the day, or mm-hmm. whatever it turns out to be, right? Mm-hmm. Um and having that sort of stuff also means that you can first just go to the city and say, look, is this really what you want? You know, we're clogging up these streets because of all these orders. Maybe they should, like, deliver it at another time. Uh-huh. That would be good for us. It would be good for the streets, you know. Sure. But you can't do that without the data. So that's one example. I think a better example is more salient at the moment. Uh, maybe not to your audience, but but more generally is, you know, during this pandemic, you've seen some communities have large death rates. Yep. And what's not clear is, is that because they had poor public health to begin with, higher rates of diabetes, et cetera, et cetera. Well, the government doesn't talk about it because it's sort of inconvenient for them. Sure. Right? Um, and so they don't let the data out. But, you know, you could go and sample, you know, just sample, questionnaire, guy in the corner, Right. Sample people and say, look, we're trying to figure out what's going on here. You know, can you anonymously put in, Mm -hmm. you know, diabetes? Are you overweight? Do you have any family? Blah, blah, blah. And you could say, God, you know, our community has these enormous rates of diabetes, and that actually explains almost all of the death rate. Sure. Or not. Mm -hmm. I don't know. You know, I don't know because we don't have the data. (laughs) (laughs) It's crazy. Who has the data? Well, the data is in hospitals, um, but they don't like to look at things like that because that's more public health stuff. Right. And it's touchy, and they don't want to get in that whole thing. Mm-hmm. And plus, within the hospital system, there's all these companies, these these for-profit entities, who don't, don't share data and claim it's by poverty, uh, by sorry, and claim that it's because of privacy. Like, no, you can't see your x-rays because yep. it's privacy. So this is BS. Right? Yep. <laughs> you know? okay. Oh God, yeah. <laughs> you know? So um, you can uh, imagine uh, doing a much better job at getting health services and figuring things out, uh, much better than what we've seen some of the national services do. But you need to have the data, and mm-hmm. and it's not the national picture doesn't help all that much. It's mm-hmm. the local picture that really helps mm-hmm. because. You know, your conditions are different than their conditions. And your rate of diabetes, of obesity, age distribution, right. genetic distribution, whatever, is going to be different. Yep. And your hospital is a different hospital. Hospitals vary a lot, okay? Mm-hmm. And they don't treat everybody exactly equally, even if they try. That's right. right? Yep. And, and perhaps more importantly, in this sort of case, public health isn't the same, mm-hmm. Okay. But how are you going to know unless you have the data? Right. And who's concerned with this? Well, it's you and your community. Hospital doesn't want to look at it because that'll just be a problem for them. Government doesn't want to even talk about it, right? Mm-hmm. Okay, well, you guys, <laughs> yeah. you, or we should do it. Right. Um, yeah, it's something as a physicist I really appreciate on the things that you talk about Um I spend most of my time thinking about how to measure things. And it's exactly what you just said. If you don't measure something, you can't know what's going on. That's right. Um, something that I'm looking forward to in the future. So we talked recently with Patty Maz and um, some other individuals who work on, um, you know, I guess you've also worked on it, but kind of wearable computational devices, um, things sure. that maybe have record EEG throughout your day. Of course, you have something like Fitbit and other things that record uh, biomarkers throughout the day. Mm-hmm. Do you have any thoughts on what more information and kind of insights uh, communities would be able to have if, for example, you had heart rate monitors for 90% of your community? Um, As an example, I think you'd be able to get, you know, you don't even have to ask your hospital. You can just inquire um, how are people's hearts, you know, working uh, in kind of a big data sort of way. Yeah. um, You can imagine a future in which case, um, the data that is diagnostic is collected automatically, mm-hmm. and you could do science like they don't even dream of today, because usually that data is collected when there's something wrong. Right. Right. You show up to clinic, they take the blood, blah blah blah, and they only look at the things 
that are likely to be the wrong ones, right? Mm -hmm. And so you don't have a baseline. You don't know the natural variation. You don't see the correlates like, is this something that's based on race? Is it based on gender? You really don't know because you never collected that data. Um, and so you could do that. Um, and I think we will get there, but it's going to take a long time. Mm -hmm. And the reason is it has to be a clear need to do that. And you need to have these... Uh, trusted entities like these data co-ops mm -hmm. to begin with mm -hmm. so you see some of that like patients like me is a little like that so mm -hmm. patients like me is a local thing it's a, a place it's a company but people contribute their data if they have a rare condition because you know if you have some rare condition you know you say well you know what's going on what do other people do well mm -hmm. there's maybe nobody in your whole city hmm. but there are thousands around the world and so they contribute their data and observations for these rare things, and then they learn from each Same. other. So it's a community sharing insights about their personal data, mm -hmm. and they do this for these rare things. It's very successful. I see. Um, yeah. Yeah, that's really um, something that sticks out to me. My partner works in healthcare, and uh, my father recently had prostate cancer. He's doing great now. But I was asking her, why don't they, there's an age before which you don't screen for prostate cancer and similar for a bunch of other things, breast yeah. cancer, et cetera. Why don't you screen, you know, throughout your life? And her answer was basically, well, because there's variations in the population and basically you could have a healthy 20 year old that you tell them that they might have breast cancer when in reality it's just a, a normal, within the bounds of normal fluctuation that would just go away if you don't do anything about it. But they don't know because they don't measure what these popular, you know, you don't have a good measure of what your brain looks like for an average 20 year old. It's only when things go wrong that uh, you take exactly. these you know, CD scans. And that seems kind of like low hanging fruit that I really hope. Well, I mean, there's things also that, you know, you can ask them sort of basic questions like, is aspirin good for you? <laughs> you know, so we've been taking aspirin, what, for almost 200 years? Yeah. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> You'd think maybe we would know if it was good for us or not, right? You know? Yeah. And they keep changing their mind. Yep. That is the mark of bad science. <laughs> I'm sorry. You know, you got got hundreds of millions of people doing this thing for centuries, sure. and you don't know. And then there's other things like milk. Is milk good for you? Mm-hmm. Mm how about sugar? Well, sure. there's all sorts of stuff about sugar, right? Oh, it's good. It's bad. It's like, well, I don't know, actually. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, the best study I've seen, actually, was one that was done in China back in the sort of 1980s before it became industrialized. Mm. Because there the, the villagers lived and died in the village. There was no big manufacturing things. So, and the diet in every village was different. Huh. Okay? So you could do a comparison across villages. And you say, well, this is a village. Here's 100 villages that drink a lot of milk. Here's 100 villages that don't. Sure. What happens? And then you can control for all the other sorts of things. And it was really interesting. It's called the China diet. Okay. You know? Huh. But that's the sort of a broad uh, epidemiological mm. approach towards things that you need to find out whether things are good, good in what context, good when in your life, mm -hmm. things like that. And we don't do it. Mm -hmm. um, and as a consequence, I think there's a lot of things that we miss that would be diagnostic uh, uh, because we just never occurred to us to look, right? right? And we don't have the data. And then there's a lot of things that are um, misdiagnosed or missed, uh, even when we know what it is, because of contextual variables, sure. which is what you just said right, right. Mm -hmm. and um you know we spend what 20 percent of our entire economy on this stuff yeah. right yeah. it's like completely absurd <laughs> that we don't do these you know population studies to determine stuff Absolutely. and i i have to think that it has um first of all people don't understand data they don't understand science mm -hmm. there's all these sort of like simple myths and ideas about it and then of course People's oxes get gored, right? Like what happens if you find out the beef isn't good for you? Sure. Well, a lot yeah. of people are going to be unhappy about that, right? Absolutely. Um, right. And so a lot of people don't want to look. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, along the topic of kind of understanding science, do you have recommendations? I mean, let's maybe take a high schooler, um, maybe an undergrad. Do you have suggestions for what they should be focusing on, what they should be working on? Do you, would you suggest just 
you know, work as hard as you possibly can understanding the basics of math and physics? Or do you suggest that they kind of take some time to try and focus their efforts on building interpersonal relationships and interpersonal skills? Well, I think that the um, the optimal experience is something which you see commonly at MIT, but not always, right? So when a freshman comes in, they strongly encourage you to get a bunch of teammates to work together yes. so you don't die. <laughs> okay? That's your team who's trying to help you yep. and they and you bounce ideas off each other and, so, and that's critical. But you also need to have this broad exposure sure. which has classes do some of it but there are other parts of it. Um, as I mentioned to you before we started this, I teach an entrepreneurship course right. because you know, the people who are in university have spent 20-odd years learning to be a gear in the machine. And and maybe you don't want to be a gear in the machine. And since the machine is changing because of technology and stuff like that, mm -hmm. maybe you're going to be an outmoded gear pretty right. soon before right. you graduate. And so um, what the course is, is is one that I refer to as brainwashing because it tries to convince people that they can think through their future for themselves, hmm. and they can find fellow travelers to bounce things off of. It's a networking thing. And you could start a company, start a new initiative, reinvent who you think you are. Um, and it's really important that you not just go into a job because that's what everybody does, hmm. that you actually think through how you're going to have impact, how it's going to feel, that you see what other people are like and see what their experience is. And that's what we offer. Hmm. Yeah, as someone that's exactly me, and I think a lot of people who um, probably watch this are just pure hard science for the past 15 years or so. Sure. And at least for me, it's really daunting to even think of how, how do you go about starting a company? I have a great idea maybe, and it's so much easier to just say, yeah, well, I'm just going to go and apply at Google and, you know, see what happens yeah, there. Yeah, exactly. And that may not be really the right thing for you. It is daunting to do it. And um, it's also not a guaranteed path at all. So Google looks very guaranteed. And, and, and you know, that path, I'll say this in a negative way, but I don't really mean it. So, you know, that's sort of like guaranteed that you'll have a decent, mediocre life. Okay. <laughs> right. Well, you know, it's not going to be bad, nope. you know, but That's you may right. not really be. Yeah. Um, whereas if you go and try and, you know, strike off on your own, you could fail horribly. Mm. And in fact, one of the things that we do in the class is we bring back people who failed horribly. You know, I remember one, one woman came in and she said, you know, we had this company, we got it together. We had the big pitch, right? And we failed. And I went back to my home. And I turned on the hot water in the shower, and I sat at the bottom of the shower for three hours, and then I realized I would probably live. <laughs> like, yep, <laughs> it feels like that sometimes. Okay. But she did live, and um, she got it back together and was eventually successful. Okay. But but you know, people got to know that it's not easy. Yeah. Uh, on the other hand, if you persevered and you made it, maybe that's going to be really satisfying. Right. The other thing that's, um, I think, important is that at your sort of age, so we're talking about 20s, that sort of thing, yep. um, is the time to take bigger risks. It's just like, you know, your investment portfolio. Sure. You can have higher variance as long as you also have higher returns right. when you're young. When you get older, you don't want that variance so much, right? right. Absolutely. And you're willing to accept a little lower returns as a consequence. Well, mm -hmm. that applies to everything. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so, well, I guess we kind of ran out of time today to talk about it, but on the topic of really high variance, there's, of course, the whole discussion of, uh, or at least currently high variance of digital currencies. And um, really, I wanted to ask you about the underlying technology, which is a distributed ledger system. Yeah. So, so um, we do a lot in this space. Um, we help... Um, Different countries set up, uh, nations set up things like that. Uh, we don't do anything with Bitcoin or Ethereum. I mean, <laughs> one of the founders of Ethereum is part of my group. Oh, but okay. other than yeah. that, we don't. I mean, yeah. it was incredibly interesting uh, technology demonstrations. They've been uh, niche investments that have been 
really, really interesting, high variance. It's wonderful from a science point of view. Sure. Um, people say, what do you mean, niche? There's a trillion dollars. Well, you know, <laughs> economy in the world is pretty big. And right. There's a lot of people that got to hide their money and yeah. launder it. And, yeah. yeah, okay, it's big. Sure. I, you know, that doesn't convince me. What I see, though, is I see nation states are setting up their own platforms, like Ethereum-type platforms, right. and they won't want competition. And you see this in China already. China yeah. has a platform, yep. and you can build on the Chinese national platform, but if you're doing Bitcoin, you're going to go to jail. Yep. That's what they say, okay? And that, you're going to see that everywhere in one form or another. Mm -hmm. um, same thing is true with Ethereum. When it, if it like raises its head enough, that sort of thing. Yeah. Um, so the opportunity is building things like distributed finance on the national chains. Right. A topic of interest is um, the trade-off between privacy and ownership and control. So Bitcoin is synonymous fully, right? And it's completely uh, ungoverned in the sense that there isn't any sort of centralized up and down. I mean, there right. actually is, but it, it's not very strong. Um, these national systems, of course, will be things that are uh, more like, say, the Visa network, mm -hmm. the number of companies, the government, etc., yeah. come together to validate things. Mm -hmm. And then you have central bank digital currencies, yep. which are either um, make 1984 look like somebody wasn't being very imaginative. <laughs> right? yeah. I mean, do you want the government to know every time you buy chewing gum? Right. Well, there we are. We're going to have a central bank digital currency. Yeah. Interestingly, um, the sensible way to do it uh, is the way China did it, uh, as far as I can tell, which is the central bank digital currency goes to commercial banks, mm. and then the commercial banks have their own version of digital stuff, which is not a central bank digital currency. And that can be a, a distributed ledger. Mm. But the thing that goes to the, the commercial banks um, is different. So the, the government can, in China, look all the way down mm -hmm. and see your chewing gum. But by default, they don't. I see. It's only when they think that you're chewing too much gum that they'll, they'll do that. And that's critical that you have a structure like that uh, for two reasons. One is the privacy reason. But the other is, is do you know where money is created? Money is not created in the central bank. It's created in the commercial banks. When they make a loan, that's fake money. Right. That's leverage, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Okay? And that is almost all the money creation. So you've got to let them uh, continue to do that. Why do you have to let them do it? Because that's where you have the risk concentrated. Not all those loans are going to be good. Right. Okay? Yep. So they try to give loans that will be good, but they fail sometimes. So a commercial bank is inherently somewhat risky, okay? Yep. Whereas a central bank, you really don't want that to be risky. Absolutely. Okay. <laughs> that would be really a bad idea. Right. Um, and so, so having the central bank keep tabs on the commercial banks through a central bank digital currency, I don't see anything too wrong with that. <laughs> uh, on the other hand, I do want someone to have risk-taking in the system right. so that we can promote innovation. Right. And traditionally, that's, right. that's the commercial banks that have done it. In fact, I would go one step further, which is I think that one of the things that's wrong today is the banks are too big. Hmm. And what that means is hmm. that small communities and local ventures have a very hard time getting funding, right. which is why venture capitalists demand so much of their return. Mm -hmm. If we could have a much more distributed system so that there were local banks, local co-ops, and things like that, we could have that risk capital available, right. probably at better rates, yep. but more tuned to the community and supporting the community. So one of the, this is the second book, right? Absolutely. Building a New Economy uh -huh. is, look, you know, we've had 30 years of centralization based on IT systems, you know, ERP systems, Oracle, all that sort of stuff, right? Mm -hmm. And as a consequence, all the local institutions, not just local banks, but local hospitals, local newspapers, right. all disappeared. Yep. Okay? Absolutely. Um, and that means the communities are disempowered. They don't have the ability to know what's going on. They don't have the data. They don't have the ability to act. Mm -hmm. You have to go to this other city, to the big tower and beg, could you please, you know, give us some money, right? Yeah. You know, that, that's inherently not right. 
And um, so I would like to see decentralized systems that support local innovation mm -hmm. uh, and are controlled locally. Obviously, there have to be guardrails on the, the local innovation. Mm -hmm. uh, but um, I think that would be a lot healthier mm. than what we have today. I see. Yeah. Okay. Well, I know we have to let you run. Yep. Um, thank, thank you, you so you. much for your time. There's Pleasure. ideas that I didn't even have the time to explore with you. So maybe we can chat again sometime. But Great. Thank you again so much. Great. My pleasure. My pleasure.